One of the things that you'll see oftentimes in the Bible, depending upon who the speaker is, is or are parables. And when you think about parables, think about what's employed to bring about this story, figures of speeches and so forth, idioms, metaphors. And when you ask someone how many parables in the Bible, you may get 30, you may get 40, you may get 50, because sometimes the Bible didn't call them outright parables. The stories are supposed to be fictional to prove an actual truth, but sometimes it's unclear as to whether this is actual fictional story. Think about Lazarus and the rich man. Is that a true story or is it a parable? Irrespective of that, what we want to do is look at some of the parables in the Bible. First things first, we want to talk about why are there parables in the Bible? More to the point, we want to deal with why does Jesus use parables? Jesus is not the only one that uses parables. There are other parables or parables in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, parables are, they were a way of life in Jewish customs. As a matter of fact, truth be told, they're a way of life in virtually every other culture that we know of today, including our own. These stories that we would talk about, that we bring up to try to get a point across. With our parables or our stories, there's oftentimes a punchline. For example, many of you heard the story of a man who was in a storm. There was a flood and a man came by wading through the water, telling him, come with me. The water's getting, getting deep. Uh, he refused to. Someone came in a boat. He refused to. Someone came in a helicopter, refused to. And then he drowned and died and asked God later, why didn't you help me? He said, I sent you three people to tell you, to warn you. Well, in that case, there's a punchline. But in many cases, when it comes to the Bible, there might not be a punchline or at least a readily understood punchline or uh, understanding from it. And so therein lies a problem. But let's deal with why Jesus gives these parables. In three of the Gospels, excluding John, Jesus uses parables. Now we want to look at why he uses these parables. Now remember in these parables, he's going to use figures of speech, symbolisms to, to convey an actual truth. And the first parable that we see is in Matthew 13. Now it's also spoken of in Mark and Luke as well. We'll look at those in just a second, Mark 4 and Luke 8. But let's go to Matthew 13, 10. And, and the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Notice what he says, granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. A couple things. One, at this moment, only, it seems like only the disciples are the only ones who are going to know because Jesus is going to reveal them. He's the only one, only they are explained by Jesus the meaning of these parables. Is it that someone outside of these Jews who may have heard it, may have understood it? Possibly, we're not really told, but we do know that when Jesus explains the parables, that the disciples can hear it. Now, we understand, one, because we have the benefit of time, we understand kind of the big picture. And then in many cases, the parables are explained. Not all the parables in the Bible, not all the parables that Jesus gives, the punchline is actually explained, but we are assumed to know the answers, especially since we have hindsight and we have the entirety of the Bible to go off of. But what's interesting to notice is that he says the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We're speaking about parables. Parables will relate to the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. We talked about this before, that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they are the same. They're used anonymously. And so we won't have that discussion at this point. But he says they are, he's using these to know or to grant these understandings of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it's not been granted. It's not been given to these Jews. And there's a reason why. Look what he says. For whoever has to him more shall be given and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. He is speaking specifically about the Jews and about the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. And there's an issue going on with them. Now he's going to quote just a little bit. He's going to quote Isaiah. So we'll go there in just a little bit. But look what he says, 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. The heart of this people will become dull with their ears. They scarcely hear and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, look what he says, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return. And I will heal them. Wait a minute. That seems odd. Don't you want them to hear with their ears and to see with their eyes and then turn around and come to you? Before we answer that question, let's go to Isaiah 6. Let's start in verse 6 and see if we can get a better understanding of what's happening here. Then one of the seraphim flew to me which, with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. 
he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. So here we have Isaiah speaking and let's get this understanding of what's happening. Let's, let's go back and look and see. And I think it'd be kind of clear as to why he's doing this. Now, remember, we're seeing some figures of speech, some imagery, some symbolism taking place in this story. Do we think that this is hack actually happened, that hot tongs or that an angel took some hot coal with the tongs and put on his tongue? No, he's seeing this in this vision. And he said, go to his people. Verse nine. Uh, tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long he answered until cities are devastated and without inhabitant houses are without people and the land is utterly, is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men from far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Now, I don't want to continue that. But the point is, he is out to do something to the nation of Israel. Israel has been disobedient. They turned their backs on God. And so what is God going to do? He is going to bring them to their knees. Now, all the while doing so, there are still going to be some Jews that are going to be brought to him in the meantime. But ultimately, there's a problem that's going on with Israel. We'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to go back to Matthew 13. And he says, verse 16, he says, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear. There are a lot of people that would be envious of you to one, be in the place of where you are, specifically that you are in before the son of man, before you are before Jesus, hearing and seeing and being shown these things. And there are a lot of men of old who would have loved to have been in the position that these disciples are in. Now, if we go back to it, we'll find out that the very first parable that he's speaking of is this parable of the sower. That's important. Now, the reason why it's important is because it speaks as to why Jesus is having these parables. Let's go to Mark 4, 13. Notice what he says. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones. Now, I don't want to go to that. I'll come back to this parable in a second. But his point is, you should understand this parable. All the other parables, if you could understand this parable, you could understand the rest, even though he gives explanation to the other parables as well from time to time. But he says, how are you going to understand the other parables if you cannot understand this parable? Before we get into this parable, let's talk about what was said previously. In Mark 3, verses 3, the end of verse 3, and beginning of four, we see him, this whole issue being brought up. What happens prior to him deciding that he is going to speak in parables only? Obviously, he knew ahead of time what he was going to do. But what did the Jews do? They began to account what Jesus was doing as something satanic, something demonic. Verse 28 of chapter three. Truly, truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the son of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit, attributing these things to Jesus. Then his mother and his brothers arrived standing outside. They, they sent word and called to him. A crowd was sitting around him. And they said, behold, your mother and your brother are outside looking for you. He says, who are, you, who are my mother and my brothers? Those that are doing the will of my father. Those are the ones who are my mothers and brothers. Then he goes on to give this parable of the sower and the soils. Well, what is this parable of? He speaks about these different people. As a matter of fact, let's go to Luke 8, and we'll see how he explains the parables and what they mean. We've covered this before, but he says now verse this. He says verse 11 in chapter 8, he says, now this uh, is this parable. The seed is the word of God, which we see. So God gives the word. Well, why? Well, so they can grow. The problem is the seed has to plant somewhere, which is their heart. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Again, this parable or these parables are for the benefit of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, for salvation. There's a salvific view in these parables. It says those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with the worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit 
to maturity. And look at verse 15. But the seed and the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. In other words, the heart is the issue. You have the word, which is the seed, and the heart, which is the soil. And there are even those who had the ability to hear, but as he says, they heard for a moment. They believed temporarily. And then they stop. So in other words, it's even possible to hear it, but not hear it. It's, it's possible to see it, but not see it. It's possible to receive it, but it be temporary. The issue is, is their heart. And so what is Jesus doing? He is granting them, the disciples, the ability to understand. Now they couldn't hear, they could understand quite well. And so Jesus explains. So he's explaining to them. The difference is with us though, we don't have Jesus having to sit us down and tell us, this means this, this means that. What we have is differently is this. Two things, as a matter of, well, three things. One, our heart is different. Our heart is regenerated. And so we can take the word of God. Our heart is different. So when the seed falls on our heart, we can take it and cultivate it. We can ponder, we can grow on it. Two, we have the Holy Spirit in us, working in us, moving us. Three, we have the benefit of the scriptures there so that we can look and see and learn and grow and study these things and have other folks also to kind of help with us as well which is what the disciples did, but they had Jesus. Now, going back again to the purpose of these of these parables, look at what's happening. He wants this hardening, this, this dulling of the ears, this blinding of the eyes to happen to who? To Israel. So remember this. He says about Israel, let's go to Romans 11, verse 8. What does Paul say? He says, just as it is written, God gave them, and by the way, this is also in Isaiah, the first point that we hear this that Jesus is quoting from is also in Isaiah, Isaiah 6. But then he goes on to say in chapter 11, verse 8, this is also quoted from Isaiah, Isaiah uh, chapter 29. He says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. So what is he doing? He's doing something with Israel. He's causing Israel not to be able to hear. Verse 25 of chapter 11, he says, I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery. Uh, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, but a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so we can kind of see the purpose of, of these parables being spoken is not to confuse the Gentiles or anyone else, but to the Jews. He's not speaking these parables to, to non-Jews, but to, the, to these Jews who uh, there's this partial hardening, there's this spirit of stupor that's over them, as, as Paul says, even down to this very day, that is at that time. So as we start looking into the parables, we're going to go through the parables and see the meaning behind them, because I think there's some very rich and beneficial, obviously, information that's there. But the reason for it, God is bringing out a purpose. One, those people that can see it and hear it, that tells us a lot about the person that can see and hear a parable. That person has understanding, and that understanding has been granted to them by the Father. The person that doesn't is the person who doesn't have understanding granted by the Father. Their heart is not in a place or position or condition to where they can receive the word and understand it. And so for these Jews, there's a reason why they don't get it. There are some that will. Again, whoever does, they've been granted the ability to. Whoever doesn't, they have not been granted that ability. And I don't mean they understand what it means, meaning there are folks who might understand what it means, but don't take it to heart. They still have not been granted that. Having eyes they see, having ears they hear but won't follow through. That means they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. If you're not following through, if you're not, because with those eyes and ears that you see and believe, you follow through, you demonstrate that. And so while the Jews understood the words that were coming out of Jesus' mouth, they didn't understand. They could not comprehend. They could not eternalize it. And so we'll notice as we go forward, when we hear these parables coming out of Jesus' mouth, there's a common theme. There's a common thread that is focusing or speaking about salvation. You will hear him say the kingdom of heaven was like this. The kingdom of God was like this. It was like this. It was like that. And so we're giving, getting a some sort of symbolism and analogy, figures of speech, metaphors, idioms to describe an actual truth about God and our salvation. And so notice he never uses parables to us, but to them. Why? Because he's doing something to them that he's not doing to the Gentile church. Amen.